want to thank our speakers for really coming down from Snohomish County. Uh, the traffic isn't always that easy and uh, to navigate. So I just want to thank you so much. And I want to thank the Lot Clean Water Alliance for being a partner in this presentation and also for generously uh, allowing us to use this space and providing snacks. So they are pretty wonderful for that. So just a little background, you know, agriculture in Thurston County is a big deal to all of us, and it's becoming more and more of a big deal. And so dairy farming uh, is an integral part of our community, and we want to do what we can to support our local farmers. But, you know, we want to foster a very healthy rural lifestyle. And we want to be able to have a very vibrant and active uh, agritourism industry in Thurston County. So we had some meetings last year where some farmers were uh, concerned about other farmers uh, applying dairy nutrients at times when people were trying to do outside agritourism activities. So they didn't all quite come together. So we put our heads together to think of how can our community exist together and have everything for everybody. So it was suggested, and, um, and one of the people that suggested it is here in the audience, Graham Sackerson, uh, that an anaerobic digester could be helpful. So he gave me a whole bunch of names to call people, and so I started with Department of Natural Resources, and I believe Pete, uh, Peter Moulton, who used to work back there. Did you ever work for them, or it's always been commerce? I want him to work for natural resources, obviously. <laughs> so I met Department of Commerce. And so he gave me a bunch of names, and then uh, started working with our the Thurston County uh, WSU Extension agent, Lucas, Dr. Lucas Patsick, and he knew all about Qualco and the efforts up there. So with that, I again want to thank everybody. And um, Lucas, if you want to please introduce our guests and then moderate our panel. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Romero. Tell me if you can't hear me. Can you hear me now? Sorry. Um, I don't know all about Falco, so I'll be really interested uh, to learn more. I, I got a tour about a year ago uh, with the contingent of visiting um, investors and agriculturals from China. It was kind of interesting. Uh, I got a, just a tour of a lot of very interesting infrastructure related to ag in Snohomish County. There's also kind of a grain dryer integrated with the calf cart facility. That was another tour that we were on. So um, we're lucky to have uh, President Daryl Williams, um, Treasurer Dale Reiner, and Systems Manager Andy Workhoven from Qualco Energy in Snohomish County. I believe you guys are in Monroe. Correct. Yeah. Um, and um, as, uh, as Commissioner Romero said, agriculture remains a really important part of our economy here in Thurston County. In fact, we have, as of 2012, 12 cow and goat dairies remaining in the county. Um, animal products in general are about 60-65% of our agricultural economy. Uh, we rank third in the state in terms of poultry production, egg and poultry. Um, so we still have a, a, a fairly substantial, um, particularly animal-based um, agricultural economy here in the county. We also have a fairly big meat industry, and I'll be kind of curious to see how that might fit in. Uh, there's a South Puget Sound Meat Producers Cooperative, which manages uh, a mobile meat processing unit which comes into this area. We also have several um, meat processors, uh, cut and wrap, uh, and butcheries uh, that deal with animal waste. So I wonder how that fits into the picture as well. So um, I, I don't want to um, say too much because we're already a little late. Um, just basically give a little outline for, for the event today. So we're going to have about 30 minutes of presentations, uh, sorry, about an hour of, of presentations and about 30 minutes of Q&A. So if you can kind of hold your questions until the very end, and then um, we'll, we should have pretty good time for, um, for questions. But we're cutting into the networking section. Uh, we were supposed to have about 30 minutes for networking. We'll see how long that goes, so stick around if you want. Um, so with that, I'd like to welcome our guests.
Incorporated, uh, Guapo is a 501c5 corporation, <coughs> which is a, uh, uh, a farm uh, a nonprofit. And as that nonprofit, uh, part of our responsibility, as we see it, is to do things like we're doing uh, here right now. And, and that's uh, uh, just to speak out about what we've, what we've done and, and, and what the, what's good about the digesters and what's not. And, and by the way, the guy here in the middle, Andy Werkholman, is, is, is the, uh, operates the digester, and it's his cows that, uh, that furnish all the cowmen are, uh, that we use at the site. And I'm going to speak just for a, a couple minutes, which would be surprising if I could do that. Uh, not for the, for the can't find enough to say, but that's just kind of the other way around. Uh, I, I'm just going to talk about what the, uh, uh, how Coapa got going and, and uh, kind of why. And when salmon were first getting listed, uh, we, we started with a, a, with a stream <coughs> called the Haskell Slough uh, that, uh, that was on property that it's, it's about three miles long and two miles of it was on property that I own. And my property is also adjacent to the, to the Skycomish River, so I have Skycomish River two miles of riverfront on one side and two miles of Haskell Slough on the other side. Uh, the, the river, the Skycomish River, was making an avulsion and trying to go through my property back to a, an old uh, uh, bed that it was in in 1873 when it was first homesteaded there. And so to get some horsepower, the salmon hadn't been listed yet, but to get some horsepower with the uh, environmentalists and, and with the tribes and with whoever, uh, we devised a plan to do some, to open up this old Haskell Slough because it, 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 well, it had been in branch of the river some years prior. Uh, at this time it had been reduced to nine ponds with just a little trickle of water uh, in between the ponds and that only happened uh, during the really wet time of the year. So when fish got trapped in there because of the floods and whatever, uh, they couldn't smolt. Uh, it, uh, it, it was, a, it was a really in bad, in bad shape. So anyway, we did a, we did a restoration project on, on the whole Haskell Slough and it was very successful. And, and we got a lot of recognition out of doing it. And while we were doing that, uh, working on the slough, uh, the, the lead agency or the, the lead uh, uh, contractor on the project was Northwest Chinook Recovery and a fellow by the name of John Sayre, uh, who's a secretary uh, on the board of directors for Blackpool. John uh, was and is, an, is the, uh, the chief uh, operator and the president of uh, Northwest Chinook Recovery, which is another nonprofit. We had a good time. We worked together really well. Uh, we then, my brother, myself, and, and a couple of other neighbors who were involved, and uh, as well as Andy Workholman, who was, uh, uh, who, who was in, involved in that project uh, uh, somewhat also. And when we finished the project, uh, we, we said, you know, this really worked well. And, and during the project, we, we done a lot of work with the tribes. Uh, the chairman at that time was Herman Williams, and, and he'd been very, uh, very helpful. And when we had a big, a big party with all the, with all the uh, uh, politicians there at the end, like there always is, you know, uh, when it's time for the credit, everybody shows up. That, uh, and you know, that's, I, I know that's not, not anything that you already don't know about, but uh, about the part. so. Uh, <clears throat> during that during that uh, uh, ceremony, uh, Herman Williams said it's it, it made some history by saying it's uh, it's time that the Indians started uh, recognizing people like uh, the Reiners for the work that they've done. And in other words, other people just uh, that that uh, uh, that were helping the environmental uh, project, and and we got to be. Uh, it, it became very obvious that we had a lot in common. Uh, farmers on one side of the high water mark of the river, the Indians on the other side of that high water mark were growing. Uh, and at the time, and I have been a beef farmer for years, uh, we, were great, we were growing beef, we were raising beef and they were raising salmon. And we had more in common with the, with the tribal folks than, uh, than we do with most everybody else. Independent fishermen and independent farmers. Uh, and much more in common than we do with Microsoft or Boeing or, or whomever. Anyway, so we, we, we developed a, a relationship. We started looking for a project. 
And finally, and we were looking for another stream to, to uh, restore or something. Uh, <clears throat> and we had decided to, uh, in fact, one of the tribal folks, uh, Daryl's brother, in fact, uh, came up with an, <clears throat> an idea of, a, of an anaerobic digester. There weren't any in the state of Washington then, so we were the first ones to, uh, to get going on it. It took us a long time to get going because we, the time we put a, a, ourselves together as a, as a, uh, uh, an organization uh, uh, and a nonprofit at that. Uh, uh, and, and by the way, the three there's three owners. The three owners that he mentioned are all nonprofits. So we have three nonprofits owning a fourth nonprofit. One of which uh, one of those owners is which is a. a a sovereign nation, so you can see that the business plan putting uh, together was a, was a little lengthy. So while we started out before everybody else, we ended up being the third digester to come online in the state. Uh, uh, but the the uh, group of of, uh, uh, of folks we put together with the farmers and the tribes uh, and the environmentalists was something nobody else had done. And in fact, the first thing we did when we put, we went back to Washington D.C. and, and uh, uh, lobbied for some for some money to get to uh, to do a feasibility study. <coughs> and we were quite successful when we walked into one of the legislators' office, and, and uh, uh, <coughs> Herman Williams was uh, was there. Then he was kind of leading the group, and he'd say, "I'm Herman Williams from the Tulalip tribes, and these are my friends, the farmers." Well, that that doesn't that wasn't occurred very often at that at that stage of the game. And so everybody listened up uh, quite uh, quite eagerly, and whenever we put farmers and fishermen together, uh, or farmers and uh, tribal folks together, rather, it, uh, it it does it opens a lot of doors. So we came away from Washington D.C. with a, a two hundred fifty thousand dollar grant for for a, a feasibility study, which was way more than it would take for a feasibility study of a grant of a uh, anaerobic digester today, but. This was when there wasn't any in the state, so we had, we looked at the, <clears throat> it was primarily for Snohomish County, so we, we, we surveyed every dairy in Snohomish County and located what spots the uh, digester would work and which, where they wouldn't, and actually came up with three spots. Uh, we, we focused on the area that we're at now, which is uh, uh, an old uh, Department of Corrections uh, uh, work facility. It was the mineral water farm uh, where they did milk cows and, and it, it was on uh, the block they were going to get rid of it. They, they stopped all the correction department had stopped all activities on the site and uh, and it was surplus property. So because of the fact that uh, uh, it, it was not trust land, it was land that was actually purchased by the state of Washington in 1929, it was eligible to be transferred to another government. Uh, without having to go through a bid process and, and all those things. So because, of course, the, tri the tribes are a government, uh, we came up with the idea of, of uh, not the tribes did, the farmers and the environmentalists uh, came up with an idea of, of uh, requesting that that property be transferred to uh, the Toledo tribes for use on this in this project. We were successful in, in the lobbying efforts in, in the at the state here in Olympia, and uh, and the property was eventually transferred uh, to the Tulalip tribes. And so the Tulalip tribes have ownership of that uh, acreage and the old dairy farm of 277 acres and a bunch of old ratty buildings that are <coughs> cost a lot more money to tear down than any of them are worth. Uh, it, it was it was in pretty bad shape, and still a lot of it is. Uh, but but the, uh, the the tribes own the land. As soon as they got title to the land, they turned around and leased it in its entirety to Coapo Energy. And Coapo Energy uh, is responsible for the taxes and everything that goes on there for the next 26 years anyway. Uh, and so that's when then we had the property and when the digester, uh, uh, when, we, when we started uh, construction and, and going forward. But the uh, uh, the point that I wanted to talk about, of course, was, was how the tribes and the farmers and the environmentalists got together and, and what, uh, uh, what, what a great group it is uh, when, you're, when you're spearheading a project, or even if you're not spearheading a project, uh, 
that uh, working together with, with uh, all of all the folks uh, are it, it, it's certainly a lot easier than going uh, doing it on your own. And that's uh, probably the first thing if you're going to if you're looking at uh, another uh, building a digester is make sure that you got everybody that's going to be involved and everybody that can be involved. Uh, you know, get them on board. That's uh, that's the, that's the first thing that I'd uh, I'd look at to make sure you got a good group of people that you're working with, or at least all of them that are everybody that's uh, uh, thinking in the same direction. And those folks that aren't, I uh, like you know, we had one lady that said that that uh, when we when we put in for our permits and said, well, that's the dumbest thing in the world. <laughs> We got the, there's a smelly cow and her up and down the valley here, and now they want to put it all in one big pile, and it's really going to smell. Well, obviously that's not the case, and if, our, if, if it smells at the digester, then we're not doing our job, because the whole purpose of the digester is to collect methane, and methane's what stinks, and, and uh, when we're done with it, it's just a flame in the air. So, uh, having said that, I'll, I'll, I'll pass the uh, uh, information, I mean, I'll pass the I might go over to whichever one of these guys wants to start talking about the construction and how what we got there. Do you want to do that? Or? Before we get into the construction, uh, uh, they all said we kind of got together and talked about how the <coughs> farmers and the tribes and the, the fish groups could kind of work together. And really, energy production uh, is just a, a side benefit of our project. Uh, the main goals were to try to uh, improve water quality for fish and improve, and also improve the economics for farming. We wanted to have that win-win situation that really helped out both sides. So you know, we were looking at uh, how we could reduce the amount of nutrients that were running into the rivers from agricultural operations and uh, also look at how we, in the process, we could uh, allow the farmers are to improve economics for farming. One of the restrictions that Andy has to deal with here for raising cows is you know, he's limited by how many cows per acre he can have by how he gets rid of his nutrients or gets rid of his cow milk. And by running it through a process where we're uh, kind of composting the fiber at the end and exporting it, we're getting nutrients off the site and uh, and allows him more acreage for spreading remaining nutrients on his farm fields for growing his crops, which also allows him to have more cows per acre in his operations. So uh, well, that was kind of the win-win scenario we were looking for. Uh, by the way, of construction, you know, our operations after we did our feasibility study, it actually took us a while to kind of come up with a design that we thought would pay for itself once we were up and running. It's, that was another kind of key of the project. Uh, it had to pay for itself. We didn't want to have to subsidize it with tribal or governmental funds to keep it running. So when we finally came up with a design we thought would work, then we kind of went ahead and made the decision to build it. And uh, uh, Tom McKenzie from our staff was one who was kind of our very uh, deeply involved in helping with the design work and overseeing construction. Andy and Dale were also very involved in that. Uh, I was kind of involved at the beginning idea stage, but once they got into construction, I handed things off to Tom, and, and then after it was built, they handed it back. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, maybe I'll pass to Andy and talk a little bit about the design of our project, since uh, he probably knows it better than the other two of us here. <laughs> Well, I, I am the dairyman here, and uh, I appreciate both of my partners and, and John who isn't with us here uh, today, but a lot. Uh, is I think one of the key key elements here, and, and then both of these guys have touched on it, is, is we all have skin in the game. When you talk about being a partner, um, that's, that's a dynamic that I think if we can figure out how to bring that more often, uh, we keep on hearing about public-private partnerships and things like that. What do they really look like? Um, I would, I think, a, a simple one that's successful. There's going to be skin in the game. 
which, which means it hurts any one of them if you walk away. Um, it has to be relevant to me if we're hurting fish, and it has to be relevant to Daryl if, um, if we're hurting dairy farms. It, 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 it's, it's important or we will not have a successful partnership. And I think this has become a tool where by the, there's nothing out there that, have, that isn't being done someplace else. It isn't like it's all brand new technology. But, it's a, but basically, I think the, the most important concept is that we all, we're, we all are held accountable for the net results that come out of it. So when I hear your, you know, your commissioner talking about how it's tough to have agritourism and dairying happening at the same time, um, you know, yes, that might be tough, but is there ways to work through that? Uh, absolutely, it has to happen. I mean, uh, cow manure smells, uh, so do a lot of other things. They always smell. And uh, I think the, the joy of, uh, I guess what you'd like to know, the technical side of the digester is, is we take what I like to call a lot of the yucky stuff, the slop in life, uh, and put it together and try to make the best results out of, uh, out of it. Uh, in a nutshell, we have a modified plug flow digester. So what that means is imagine a big cement box that's uh, multi-chambered and, and it's like a big pressure cooker in essence that you're holding slop at 100 degrees for 17 to 21 days retention time and you're harvesting the gas out of it. What we receive uh, on site is basically uh, all the manure off our dairy. Our dairy is actually located a mile and a half away from the digester. We pump all of our manure uh, through buried lines down there. Uh, makes the dairy very pleasant because we have no manure on site that isn't just brand new fresh manure. And uh, classically, uh, there's, there's still odor when you have cows. You're going to have odor, but you do not have that rancid odor that's so strong when you're emptying a lagoon, when you have that, that real anaerobic bacteria breaking out to atmosphere. So uh, it, it's definitely helped the, the pleasantness out the dairy. And it didn't just ship it down, down the road either. It, it, so it's, it's in sealed lines the whole way, and it gets there. Actually, the source of any odor at our digester, and it's something that probably can be addressed, is we have a receiving pit where that goes. And it's also the point where we uh, dump in other, what we call substrates. Uh, we take a lot of uh, restaurant grease, trap, uh, fats, oils, and greases from restaurants. We take, uh, we take blood from a packing house. Uh, we've taken <coughs> some fish waste, and historically we've taken egg waste, uh, Historically, there's there, basically if it fits in the category of slop, that's that's and that's the best way to put it because it, it, it people we typically get this if you have uh, if it's if it's really solid, that's what solid waste handling facilities are good at, and if it's if it's water, real liquid, that's what sewers are good at. But what kills both of those systems typically is that wet slop in the middle, and there's quite a bit of slop in our society that typically we don't like to look at or talk about, and uh, and we're good at that. This 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 system thrives on it. So you're running about from five to fifteen percent dry matter inside one of these vessels. It cooks. At the end, you separate the solids from the liquids. Uh, the solids we we turn into a really uh, actually a very beautiful compost that you can. Uh, They'll do a nice job of making a nice, very nice compost. And the effluent goes off into storage lagoons that we're sprinkling on our fields. Uh, the effluent, if you're to change the characteristics of it, it is definitely does not carry a fraction of the odor of what raw manure does, uh, which is a highlight. Uh, it's easy to sprinkle all, all season long on, uh, during the growing season. You have to deal with it a little different than raw manure because the nutrients are readily available. So you have to manage it differently. Uh, it, it's a, 
the bacteria kill the scientists out there. We've got a really good relationship with Washington State University. They've been doing work out there for, well, they started working, well, probably for 20 years already, but they've been right alongside this digester the whole time because they haven't had that many other opportunities to work with them. But the smart guys tell me that in the long run, they believe uh, just controlling pathogens is going to be one of the greatest assets that they see scientifically out of digestion process. Then, and we, we believe that to be true. It's not 100% perfect. We don't run into a pasteurization phase uh, yet, but I think there's high likelihood and easy opportunity to do that now. Um, there's power there available. Um, one could do it, yet yeah, you're already at 100 degrees. It isn't that much more to bring it up to 140 and be done with it. So the, that it, it provides some great opportunity that way. Um, the methane, we're converting all into electricity. Um, we believe there's opportunities uh, different than electricity in the future that may be more viable. It's typically uh, it's typically very market orientated. We're, we've seen already massive change in the industry and how uh, when we started this, the capital costs and everything were just outrageous. And in some things, they still are. Uh, we were discussing spark plugs on the way up here. How can we spend $1,000 on spark plugs? That's for a change of spark plugs. So there's things that are <coughs> outrageously priced. The more that this happens, the, the, the more balanced I'm sure that will become. Um, but technology to clean the gases, for example, to use it in... Uh, for automotive use uh, has come the project they're looking at in eastern Washington. Um, it's twice the size of ours in gas production and it, it will be able to do that and probably make that an economically viable size unit. But five years ago, I'll bet you their prices were probably two to three times higher than what they are today. So we, we're seeing some of that balance come back down. So I, I think the more this happens, the, the better the economics will look at it. What we thrive on right now is economically is we, we sell our electricity, but uh, we get tipping fees for the substrates that are coming in because these are products that otherwise are tough disposable products for, you know, the grease trap, things that they haven't, that sewers don't want, you know, and they have to charge what it costs to clean them up, and frankly, it's cheaper for us to clean them up. What we think is exciting about this in the long term and, and, uh, is, and I'm hoping our society picks up on it even more so, is there's value with nutrients, there's value with all that stuff. And that we, if, we, if we can take nutrients, and this is, a, I, I really believe the science says we're headed the direction that we can partition nutrients out into piles that are easier to, just to, to bring it out of theory, this is nitrogen, this is potassium, and this is phosphorus, and we need it, and we need, these are the places we need it at specific times. The technology to do that, I think, is going to come through digestion, uh, especially in the field of both nitrogen and phosphorus removal. Uh, is temperatures are used for one thing, and the phosphorus changes uh, its compound form into an organic phosphorus, which you can remove much simpler out of uh, digested manure. It's tied up in regular bomb manure in a different way. Um, with that said, I'm not going to stand here and criticize raw manure as a product that was horrible out of the dairy industry for years because it's fed every generation of families from the beginning of time till now. Uh, I think, again, if I were to say it, the beauty of what Coaco has done, I think, is it's helped. It helped uh, people like myself learn values of uh, people like Daryl or John, and yeah, respect for what they're trying to do, and I, and and I did, and their respect for what we try to do is uh, is is so much greater when they vote when everyone has skin in the game. And it makes, it isn't about 
what I get or what he gets out of the deal because it, this is our deal. It's not just, it ain't me or him, it's, it's ours. And that, that is a big ticket picture, I guess. So I guess with that, bring it along. Okay, yeah, uh, the slop that uh, Andy was talking about is actually a pre-consumer food waste uh, category under state rules. And uh, we're operating under a state exemption from uh, solid waste management with our digester and the exemption allows us to bring in up to 30% of what goes into the digester as pre-consumer food waste. Uh, they're primarily looking at the pre-consumer to avoid uh, human pathogens that could be involved in the project. Um, <coughs> and, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the funding for our project as well. Uh, Dale mentioned we had a $250,000 grant uh, that was through the Department of Energy for doing the feasibility study. We also had a $500,000 grant uh, that was used to help pay for the construction. That we had uh, 2.6 million in a clean renewable energy bond. That was zero interest bonding uh, through the federal government, but managed by Bank of America. And the uh, bank charged a 1% finance fee. And that's 1% simple interest, so it's not compounded daily. So that uh, helped save some money there too. And uh, Toledo uh, kicked in uh, 350,000 to help get things started while we were waiting for the banks to come in. And then there was a lot of volunteer time from our Qualco board members to you know, work on designing oversight and management of the facility. Um, and as uh, Dale said, the land that we're using was actually donated by the state of Washington for this purpose. And uh, they have uh, covenants on the property, so if the property is ever used for anything else, the state can ask for the land back. Uh, but. Uh, We've been kind of working with uh, the work over dairy, uh, Andy's farm, as on a uh, barter agreement. Uh, in exchange for the day-to-day -day management of the operations, he's been able to grow food crops for his cows on our property and hold some of his cows in the barns there using other parts of the property. And uh, we haven't really taken a real close look at uh, financially who comes out better on that deal, but uh, both of us seem to be happy. So. <laughs> So uh, hopefully we're somewhere close, closely balanced on uh, who gets the greater benefit. But uh, this has been a good working relationship. And uh, I think uh, Dale wants to add something here. As a treasurer, I have to say something economically feasible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when, when, we looked, when we were looking at, at building this project, uh, and, and going through all the this could happen and this could happen, we came up with some some uh, and some information. One of them was uh, we, we surveyed all the dairies around the, that were close enough to be uh, utilizable uh, with their manure in, in, in our uh, digester. And and uh, basically we, we found out that uh, that if each if the digester was working, uh, how many cows each one of them would put on, and that the uh, it, the total cows. Uh, that we figured we'd have added to the local uh, herd, if you group them all together, was 1,685 cows. And those 1,685 dairy cows uh, would produce an additional $6.4 million of gross farm gate income. Uh, the, uh, the the $64 million of, or $6.4 million of, of uh, gross uh, farm income uh, because of the fact that it, it's a, a commodity uh, when it gets shipped and, and, and broken down into ice cream, uh, uh, butter, you know, all the products you make out of milk, and, and then when you add all the, uh, uh, the other things like, like the transportation and the cost of packaging and, and uh, everything together, and you use a, an economic uh, a multiplier that the that the uh, that we got from Washington State University. That six point four million dollars of gross income would translate to four uh, to nineteen point seven million dollars worth of economic impact uh, to the immediate or to the community. And it would also 
those uh, additional cows would would add another 28 uh, on-farm jobs, most of which would be uh, milkers and and uh, and folks that milk cows uh, get, get a, a fairly decent salary. They get definitely a living wage, uh, uh, and and most of the uh, the uh, milkers. Uh, I'm not sure what Andy pays is right now, but they're they're about 13 to 15 dollars an hour. There's generally other benefits that that, uh, that go along, like insurance and and um, you know it depends on, on the farmer. But that 28 additional uh, on-farm jobs. Again, with the uh, with the right multiplier supplied by the, by the university, uh, would create an additional 97 jobs in the community, uh, which then includes teachers and grocery store clerks and and everybody uh, together. So that's that that's pretty impressive. Um, being able to add 19.7 million dollars and uh, the jobs, and, and I didn't even, even that that doesn't even uh, account for. The uh, value of the electricity or the energy we produce it doesn't account for uh, the, the value of the uh, uh, products that we're destroying. That, uh, that, that the uh, uh, carbon credit, the carbon that we're, we're destroying, even uh, because the, even though we don't utilize all of our uh, methane in in the engine that runs the generator, a, a lot of it is is burned off. In fact, right now I think we're Probably using about the, a half, or about a third to a half uh, of the methane we're actually producing. So, but the rest is being destroyed, and it's a, uh, and so it's no longer in our environment. Also, on, on the income side, uh, we make uh, seventy-three percent of our income comes from tipping fees, which means that uh, and. The other 27 percent come from the electricity, and, and next year that's going to change because uh, we're in the last year of our five-year contract with the power company, and and, uh, and the power companies are telling us that we're going to be uh, that, that value of that electricity is going to be dropping by about 40 percent for our next contract. That's because you've all been too good about turning off the lights and getting those fancy curly Q light bulbs and turning in your old refrigerators and turning off the lights and all those things. We're actually uh, we got way more electrical power than we need, oh, and, and so uh, that's not a good thing. The good thing is that if you're looking at something here in the, uh, just, we're still in Thur uh, Thurston County here, uh, you're close enough to the metropolis area that these waste products that, uh, um, like Andy was mentioning, uh, and what I just mentioned, uh, we're making a major amount of our income off of. Is a, uh, that's where they come from. And, and those guys that are getting rid of that product, uh, they all pay tipping fees, all except for one. We have one uh, supplier who doesn't pay tipping fees, and that's, uh, uh, that's booze. Andy didn't tell you that, but we get uh, about, about three truckloads of that a week. Uh, and that's actually what it is. It's uh, beer, wine, uh, other uh, syrups that are uh, uh, past the pull date in a grocery store or wherever they're marketed. And so they have to be they have to be pulled and we, we have a, a an entrepreneur that, uh, that takes the breaks down those beer cases and six packs and bottles and cans and and uh, reuses, recycles the cans and the aluminum and the and the uh, glass and the cardboard and all that. And and all the rest of the all, all the liquid was going down the out, out in the sewers and so when he started bringing, bringing that up uh, uh, to Monroe, it became, I mean, within 10 minutes of putting that in our reception pit, we could see the flames start picking up, and boy, for the next couple of hours, it was really cool. <laughs> <laughs> So it really, uh, it really uh, it, it helps what we're doing. Yeah, we metered it more slowly now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we, well, we put it in on a tank, and we just uh, metered in. But, uh, but the, the other thing is uh, that it... Uh, the, the booze doesn't have any uh, any residual, uh, any leftover nutrients. And there's two more things, and I'll and I'll shut up. Uh, <laughs> hopefully, the uh, let's see what were they? Well, one of them was if you haven't seen our website, you really need to look at it. Uh, it's quaffoenergy.org. 
I think. I don't look this up, which, um, yeah, falco yeah. energyorg But yeah, the dash in there. There you go. Glafo energyorg And it'll tell you about how we, it'll tell you probably everything that we already told you, but uh, it'll say it maybe better. Uh, that was a nice sunny day, so we were talking better that day. But anyway, that's really it. And, and there's about the three different. Uh, Three different tapes on there, about uh, 20 minutes a piece, <coughs> minutes a piece, whatever they are. Four of them that are around 10 to 15 minutes a piece, I think. So, so you don't have to do it all in one sitting, but but, uh, but you should really look at it if you're interested in digesters, and, and also if you're interested in how Guapo has got formed. And then the other one of those two things, uh, gosh, I don't remember. Uh, <laughs> it was probably important. I'll, I'll interrupt somebody and say it later, maybe you. Uh, but uh, yeah, when we designed our facility, we designed it primarily for, well, actually, we designed it for cow manure only. Uh, the state hadn't changed their laws yet, and uh, so we weren't planning on putting any other kind of waste product in the digester. And with the amount of cow manure we have coming in, I think we probably would have had enough for producing about 220 kilowatts of power, somewhere around there. Uh, but by bringing in the 30% food waste, that really uh, increased the energy production. Uh, you know, cows are pretty effective at stripping energy out of their food, so we're getting what's left. And with the raw food products coming in, uh, we're getting the full energy potential, which are about six to eight times greater than that of the raw cow manure. Uh, well, except for the beer, wine, and soda, which is a lot more than that. Uh, but. Uh, by adding that 30 percent, uh, we we probably our our generator has a max capacity of 450 kW, and we are probably generating enough gas to uh, create 1.2 megawatts of power. So the food waste really makes a big difference in the amount of energy production. And so we're looking at different ways of making use of that excess gas that that uh, we have. So. Uh, we're looking at upgrading our generator to have more electrical generation. Uh, the rate that uh, costs are coming down for scrubbing the gas to meet pipeline quality, you know, that may be a future option for us. Uh, right now, I think you need to have about double our production to make that economical. Uh, we're also looking at using uh, gas for uh, drying facilities, for drying manure that could be used more like a fertilizer project, or project, or project, <coughs> I should say. And uh, but we're also looking at heat for greenhouses and other options for heat. Uh, now the gas we have is about, uh, I think we're averaging somewhere around 55 or 60 percent methane. So, uh, you know, it's not a pure natural gas, but it's for a it is still good for a number of purposes. I think it might have to clean it up a little bit for using a dryer facility, but not as much as uh, scrubbing it to pipeline quality. And uh, by the way, some of the benefits of the project, and you know, we already mentioned that it does help reduce odors. Uh, we think it helps reduce the amount of uh, nutrients that uh, come off the property. Uh, I think it also helps Andy out in managing nutrients on his farmlands because, uh, as he said, uh, you know, the raw manure needs to really break down over about a year to bring the nutri or convert the nutrients into a form that the plants can really use. Uh, but, you know, that's just the process of the slow decomposition where the digesters speed up that decomposition uh, faster and the nutrients that come out of it, the plants can uptake right away. So you can use that effluent more like a fertilizer uh, rather than cow manure. And uh, that adds some efficiencies to managing a farm. Uh, of course, we got the creation of renewable energy. Uh, the waste products we're bringing in are not going to landfills or wastewater treatment plants, which is beneficial to us and to them because, as uh, was mentioned earlier, those facilities really aren't designed to handle that kind of materials. And, uh, of course, we're reducing methane emissions into the atmosphere. And, uh, and 
uh, we are improving the economic viability of the farms in the area. So yeah, you know, we think there are a lot of good things that come out of our project and uh, not much on the negative side of the ledger. So uh, we're you know, part of what we do is try to get out and outreach to people and talk about the benefits of these projects and try to encourage uh, development of more of these within our state. Dale? I remembered that other thing. <laughs> and actually, I probably should have started with that. The whole reason for this whole project, you mentioned several good things that come out of it, but the, the whole reason uh, that, that we wanted to do this was, and the reason that we put these people, that, that these people were all interested in, is, is there's two reasons. Number one, <clears throat> the dairy farmers uh, are subject to the amount of acreage they have and the area available to get rid of their their uh, dairy and their excess nutrients. And the excess nutrients are the ones that their plants don't use up uh, during the course of the year. And with with the with that rule in effect, uh, they can only grow so big. The digester, in the way of helping the farmers. Uh, the dairy farmers uh, first, of course, but it was uh, uh, that, that we're concentrating these nutrients and we're, we're reforming them into a, a, a like Daryl uh, mentioned, uh, you know, raw manure. If you're a farmer, you, you probably know that raw manure will take three or four years and even uh, it'll even be benefits beyond that uh, in, in nutrients that are, your, that are uh, uh, becoming plant uh, soluble or plant usable anyway. So, not only does it break those nutrients down to where we can, it, 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 all, it, all the digester does is accelerates the, the, uh, uh, the breakdown by keeping them at 100 degree temperature for 30 days, uh, or whatever the length of time in the digester is. Uh, but but the, was, the idea was to be able to let the dairy farmers grow to whatever size they wanted to grow to based on uh, the type of management they had, you know, whether it's a a single uh, farmer, or whether it's a, a three generations of farms, or whether it's a dad and, and four kids, or three, whatever. And, and, and so that they could grow their business to the size that, th that they wanted to fit their management style, uh, and at the same time, uh, uh, and also their, their uh, uh, capacity to, uh, uh, to invest with the amount of money they had. That will be that's being accomplished by the digester collecting these nutrients and, and uh, putting them in, in, in composting them into into a, uh, a compost that carries 38 percent of the nutrients with it as we can move it out of the, out of the uh, watershed up into somebody else's uh, or someplace else where, where, where they where they need it. So that's a uh, that was the reason for the farmers getting involved. The reason for the tribes getting involved and the environmentalists getting involved is because, again, going back to that total daily nutrient or total daily uh, uh, load of uh, nutrients, if there's an, an overload of nutrients, uh, and it, 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 we end up uh, leaching a lot of those over the winter time, a lot of those nutrients are being leached into the ground. When they're leached, or else they're running off with the with the rains and the, and the snow water. When they're running off, they're running into into uh, the rivers and streams and end up in in, in the rivers and and uh, when they're leaching into the ground, uh, they often get right into the, the those nutrients will end up in the water table and they'll they'll also uh, float out to the stream. So those were the two issues that that uh, uh, and, the, and the biggest one is is well, it's all about nutrients. It, that's the main thing if you're looking at, at a digester uh, that you have to deal with. Uh, it, it's, it's nice to look at at 73 percent income from imported products, but all those products that uh, that come in uh, exacerbate that problem by bringing in nutrients with them. So you got to have a way to get rid of the nutrients. That's the uh, uh, that, that's the driver behind this whole thing is controlling nutrients. So we the the alternative energy we produce, and that that's that's very nice. We, uh, we're feeding that. Uh, we put 300 megawatts into the, the grid every month, and, and uh, I've been told that that has stood up for about 300 homes. So, so that's a good thing, but not nearly as important as as a nutrient reduction. And that's 
but when we designed the facility, we were originally looking at tying in four farms, but due to the economics of the time, the other three farmers kind of dropped out. But we decided to go ahead and move ahead with just the one. And uh, so uh, when we started operation, we did have excess capacity, but we kind of filled that capacity with the food waste that we're bringing in. We'd still like to tie in other farms, but we're going to have to expand our facility before we can do that. So Steve Brown, and I saw another hand over there. Just one second, there's a hand over there. <laughs> what do you wish you'd done differently? Yeah, yeah, what do we wish? You wish we'd done differently? <laughs> Just about everything. <laughs> when, when, we, when we built the, the digester that we have, uh, uh, I mean, there was a lot of fancy digesters out there. We spent two years running all over the country, and a couple of our people were all over the world. I don't know how many times Andy was back uh, in, in, on the East Coast, but uh, so we looked. Did, there were some really sexy ones out there with pipes that run all over the place. You know, it looks industrial. We settled on one. We settled on because it was the only one that would guarantee that would would produce so much uh, electricity uh, per cow. The the digester we, that we built and that we owned was built, it was designed for nothing but cow manure. During the same period we were building the digester, we were also in Olympia down here trying to, uh, we were lobbying for uh, the right to put other products besides cow manure in and, uh, and still remain, uh, and, and, still, and still get that uh, exemption uh, from uh, a solid waste permit by being a dairy digester. So while we were, we, in fact, we, we, we were under, we were finished construction, we were trying, starting to heat up the, the process, and it was December, December 13th, I believe, in uh, 2008. And we got a tank with a million, what, what 50 million? What, what's it? No, it's, it's 1.5 million. million gallons uh, of cold commoner in it that we got to get up to 100 degrees and and so we were, in, we, we were just burning up tons of propane trying to heat the system up enough to get it up to where it would start to, it, it, our bugs could, could live. So the, whole front, the whole thing about a digester is, I mean, what, what you're doing is we're just, we're just farming bugs. We got these little microbes in there that, uh, in fact, we went up, uh, one of the benefits of being the third one, not the first one, is we ran up to a, a Vanderhoek's uh, uh, digester up by the Canadian border. And, and trucked down a couple of <coughs> tanker loads of, of their uh, manure uh, or their, their product from their digester, which was already had the bugs in it. It was kind of like uh, making a, a sourdough, uh, you know, where you got to have a starter. And so that, that's what we used it uh, as a starter. But in any case, we were trying to get this digester heated up, and, and we were also just about uh, finished with our. our uh, issues down here as far as uh, our lobbying and so we got the uh, uh, Department of Ecology is allowing us to, to start early. Everybody knew that it was going to pass and so they, they allowed us to start putting in uh, these other uh, substrates and that helped get us up to, uh, to, to heat faster and, and, uh, and get the, the project up and going. But the net effect of all this allowing us this extra 30 percent of, of uh, uh, substrate was that uh, uh, we were now putting products that were this, this, this digester wasn't designed for. So we've had to change out our, our, our separators and press uh, system because it's a, it's a different product than just straight counter. We've had to, we've had to cut uh, holes in this big uh, concrete uh, tank and, and, uh, uh, and put in the uh, putting clay agitators to keep uh, to keep this stuff stirred up because the grease uh, that, that comes in has a tendency to, to uh, ball up. And Andy, would you say? Or yep, sticky. It gets, it gets sticky. So we, we're, we're actually producing a completely different product than we started with. And we've been, uh, we've been uh, well, I said the December 13, 2008. So it's been, it's been just a, a tad over four years. And over that four years, we've been continuously uh, changing uh, to, to meet the uh, changing our equipment to meet the, the uh, uh, product that we were uh, 
that, that we're bringing in. And of course, when you're getting 78 percent of your income or 73 percent of your income from that product, it, it's quite important. And, and that's why also we don't have any other farms there. It's not just Andy putting on those. I, I mentioned the 1,600 and the uh, 85 cows additional. Well, <coughs> they put on a good share of cows. We've made up the rest of those cows with that other product being hauled in. And, and so uh, they, uh, that's that's what we do different. We build a whole different plant. Uh, we take another look at it. And, and, uh, uh, it doesn't mean the one we built wasn't the best one for for the time, but uh, the, that's that's what we do. Several things. Okay. First, that hand, and there, and then Matt. This one. Yeah. Um, I, I haven't heard you mention any um, definable find benefit for the salmon? I mean, if you get something that's twice as efficient at removing nutrients than the double number of cows, how is that a net gain for for the salmon? What is How is their product different enough? What does it change that makes it still better? If well, you increase increases. the load on the land by bringing more cows in, because you've now taken nutrients out, are you back to where you started, but with more cleaner cows? We yeah. have more cows on the property, but right. we're also you know, getting that raw manure into the digester and exporting some of those nutrients through the compost. But the other thing is, but besides changing the nutrients into a form that the plants can uptake more readily, it's also transferring into a form that tends to bind to the soils better. Uh, so uh, the rings can't carry as much nutrients off the field as they used to. Is there monitoring at the at the transition between water and farm to see how that has changed? Uh, WSC had monitoring stations on our property, and they actually uh, applied some of the the effluent just adjacent to their monitoring stations, and still couldn't pick it up after a rain event. So uh, it's the WSU's own monitoring that uh, shows that for us. I think I think he summed that up pretty good. Yeah, I mean, they couldn't. Or we weren't trying. You know, we weren't trying to pollute before. Right. Um, so it's hard to say. I don't fish. These two guys fish. They kill a lot more fish than I ever have. <laughs> 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 sure but, but 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 we get, we're we the, we're the ones that are always pointed out. Uh, I think. So in essence, we have tried to create a, a, a more sustainable setup that way that you can control those nutrients. And I think ultimately, the real big picture that we're going to see in the future where we can, we're doing some nutrient recovery systems on, we make nutrients in forms. Already we know we can condense them more so that we can put them on a truck and we can haul them further so our water, the shed that we're distributing them on is is more appropriate. That's one of the things that we initially picked up on. <clears throat> but um, the latest technology, basically, they're doing ammonia stripping and phosphorus stripping, uh, where they're taking it out and you're actually packaging it. Uh, the ammonia will come off as a liquid, as ammonia sulfate. And the, it's struvite is a product that they can harvest the, the phosphorus in. And, that, that's just stepping up. I think the, a big reason to support these things, frankly, is I think five years from now you're going to see some incredible uh, technology with that. We're just you're, we're at the beginning of a learning curve with these things, and uh, if you don't step out and try to do it, uh, it it's not going to happen. And that's that's where I think these need to be supported, and there is merit and some public support in that because in essence it's not. Uh, it's a societal issue. We can the, the day you look at nutrients and quit saying you say nutrients are a value versus a burden. Yeah, it's just a matter of where they are and how they're used. Um, is the day we can get better at it. And fish will benefit from that just as much as people and land. Uh, it isn't about us. It's about our kids and our kids' as kids. Really, that's what I think. It's a I guess let me can I chime in real quick with one question. So 
uh, nutrients is a value, uh, I wholeheartedly agree, because now we have all these crop farms that are applying nutrients. So what's the tie-in there? Because I've been out there, I saw some bean farms, maybe it was even on the property uh, in Snohomish County. But what's the tie-in in terms of transporting more nutrients then to maybe some of the crop farms or even onto your own silage fields? Or um, are you guys then selling the nutrients to some of the local crop farmers? Or we, we've, we've sold some, most of it we basically had to, they, they've covered the cost of trucking and it's, it's, it's always boils to economics, but it's been, for some of them, it's been more economic, you know, versus buying a commercial fertilizer, um, if they can, how far you can truck it. But basically, trucking, you're kind of limited to, you get beyond 10 miles, it gets, it gets relatively expensive, that's where more condensing and concentrating is uh, one of the key factors we believe that that will happen. Uh, solids you can afford to haul a lot further. It's water that you mm -hmm. you can't afford to haul haul water. water. You want clean. clean nutrients is what you is what you need. Uh, did you see an increase in tonnage per acre on your crop? So when you uh, applied that digestive manure to it instead of uh, Regular raw? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, and no. Um, and that, that's part of the learning curve of how to deal with this stuff. Uh, where I'd say no is uh, at first, you know, this, you know, with, with cow manure, you, you, you apply and you get this regular raw manure. You apply it evenly all, all over and, it, and you watch it kind of. It comes and go. This is a little bit more like commercial fertilizer than you put it down. So if you miss a streak, it's very evident that you, you miss a streak. I mean, and, and, and you, you have to be better at your application. And otherwise, uh, and it's just so evident. And like I said, it, uh, so we didn't know how, how relevant that was. You, you don't have, like I always say, the old-fashioned manure has a little bit more of a banking factor. Here, you're dealing a little bit more with what you're doing today. So, that's a different management technique. You just got to, it, it's good. It's, it, it is good. Uh, what I really enjoy is we are able to apply on corn, on corn ground, until uh, way late in the season because the effluent's almost like a watery tea. It's not... Uh, it's not a, it's an easy, you can apply it on the plant, you know, to within just a few weeks before harvest. That, so that was a real treat, especially during dry season. I have one more, do um, a soil test, do your nitrogen levels ever go down or up from previous years before uh, you layer applying it? Oh. The soil samples. The yeah, we, we see, we're probably almost more roller coastery in our soil samples trying to understand that concept of did I, when I just applied or as far as application timing and those kind of things. So it's a little, that, that is more intense. It's, it's different. I just think it's a little, you just have to understand the product you're working with. And there wasn't a lot of people out there to give you lessons at first. That, that's the one thing you, you, you got to bear in mind. I, I looked to, <coughs> With great respect to guys like Daryl Vanderhoek, some of the first guys who really cut teeth in the area, and uh, and it's frankly it's very nice to talk with owner operators uh, who are responsible for the whole picture of it because how you deal with your effluent, those products are it's there's a lot to learn, and it's uh, it's good stuff. I, I'm very thankful that the university has been out there helping us a lot with it, but. Uh, yeah, the first time you go out, you don't know. I mean, so. But it's, it's been good. So let's maybe go back to you and then Matt. So with your power purchase agreement expiring next year and the rates coming down like 40%, are you still going to be putting in another gen set to increase power production or maybe looking towards cleaning and shipping the gas? Or what's the kind of long-term plan? <laughs> We're working on that every month. I'm going to tell you what they're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're going to upgrade this generator because, like, 
any good Dutchman, they always you know you you always fight low prices with more milk. <laughs> so, <laughs> but you don't want to get. It. But no, the bottom line is uh, one of our options, probably a very reasonable option, is uh, we're looking at an upgrade in capacity that actually we can take our existing engine and spin it faster, and we can produce a third more electricity, and help overcome some of our costs short term. Whether you want to commit um, to a whole other engine, a whole which is a much larger capital outlay, uh, is questionable. Because just again, you're right at this crux of watching technology change. It's a very interesting time to be, and then you're talking about the right thing. If you're at all interested in digesters, what are you going to do with the power? When we started, everybody wanted it. They really don't want the power now. The only reason they're buying the power from us is because they have to have a certain amount of alternative energy. And that's uh, mandated by the federal government, by the state, and everybody else. Uh, so they, they, the power companies would be happy with just a, a dump on our energy in a, in a hole someplace. The, it, it's very difficult. Uh, it's true, we, we argue about what we're going to do, how we're going to expand, are we going to expand uh, he's got ideas, i got other ideas, and don't forget I'm the treasurer, so. <laughs> <laughs> Which really doesn't mean nothing, except for of course, to do what, I, what they want me to do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, not only is it, it, the, the, the price of electricity uh, going down, or the value of, of selling electricity, the value of electricity going down, but also uh, uh, that of natural gas. And, uh, you know, obviously with the Bakken and going on here in the, in the center of our, of our country here with the, with the gas and the oil that they're going to restrict the natural gas that we've got. Uh, I mean, it, the natural gas right now is at the lowest price it's ever been. And so for us to produce gas, uh, we could do that. We could take, instead of making the electricity, we could clean the gas. It only costs about five million bucks for a system to clean the gas. And for a little outfit like us, it probably takes about 300 years to, to get it uh, paid off. But, so we're probably not going to go that way. Uh, but what, what, what I think uh, we should do is we, we need to, to, to use the digester as a nucleus of bringing in other uh, businesses that, that, uh, 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 that would thrive on, on the use of our gas on the use of our compost, on the use of our, uh, uh, what, what do you call this, effluent. Uh, you know, maybe uh, maybe around the digesters we should have a big group of, of uh, uh, greenhouses or, or whatever. But we need to find out how to, we, we need to figure out how to set our own prices and do our own thing rather than just try to catch up with the big guys all the time. And in the long run, we're going to win because we're the ones that, uh, I mean, we're the only alternative energy that gets rid of waste and that, that turns it into something valuable and that all the things that we've been talking about up here for the last uh, uh, hour or whatever and, and all the things you'll see on our, on our uh, website. So it's very difficult to try to come up with a, a plan that's going to work when, when the target keeps changing, uh, but it's... it's uh, we're committed, so we're going to come up with it. We're going to make it happen. Uh, that's why we're talking about the, we just finished a, a, a little study that we got a little bit of money from the state from, and, 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 and most of it, or it's a good share of it, Quapo put in, uh, to separate the nutrients in, in the, our effluent. Uh, we, we, we got to get our effluent so clean, and we can do that, so that we can run all that excess water that's coming in in those trucks right out into the river. We got to get the nutrients separated into, a, into an area that we can sell them just as nutrients, or we can take those nutrients and, and put them in with our compost so we, to actually spike it. So we're actually selling, uh, when we sell, or when we haul off a load of compost, we're hauling off a load of, of a high nutrient rich compost that's uh, more like a fertilizer. So. There, there's a lot of different options, and, and, and we're going to probably end up doing a little bit of each one of them, except for that gas thing. That's a little too much. Matt, did you have a question? Well, it's evolved so much since I, I first formulated it. It has to do with the fluent. Um, 
It sounds like you're separating the liquid and the sludge into a compost. Um, how do you do that? A series of separators, in essence. Uh, you're screening. It's it, 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 it's screening, and they've had uh, in the experiment Dale was talking about where we went to a next day. Right now, it's just purely screening. But where they we were looking at where you post screening, you actually take it and run it through dissolved air flotation, and then uh, ultra filters and reverse osmosis. And we're actually we're trying to study where we got the biggest bang for the buck on it. Uh, the ultra filter was really exciting to us, what we could do with it. Um, Daryl over at the tribe is really used to in the municipal system where part of his life has been looking, working on those kind of treatment systems. And uh, it was amazing how much of the work we could get done with that ultra filter. So we hope to pursue that more, looking at what we could do with concentrating our nutrients. I, I think Dale's exactly right. Theoretically, we have to get to that point where that water is, is good enough that it can be 100% recycled. Um, and if we can come up with mechanisms of how to do this and keep control capital costs, um, it's a doable deal. Now, ultimately, the price, the problem is not just price of, uh, of, the, out, of the, the things you're getting. Uh, I'm not a believer in high-priced electricities or even high-priced commodities. Uh, our, our problem isn't, isn't our milk price, it's our feed costs. Um, if we can have, if we can control the costs, and if these costs come down, the capital costs in a digester, if, if they reduced it, if, if you reduced them in half, it would change the economic. You know, bear in mind, things like these engines, they're not, it's ridiculous in my mind that an engine that looks, it's the size of a car or a minivan. It, but you, you have to pay 800 to a million, 800,000 to a million dollars for a motor like that. It, at the end of the day, I go, but it's just a motor. Um, right. uh, it's, <coughs> so there's, uh, I, these capital costs, I think, will change with time. I mean, I, I could buy a lot of tractors for that for a million bucks, and, and they're a lot more impressive to me than that motor. Uh, um, have you thought about um, combining like a steam engine as to get rid of your excess gas? You could generate steam, purify your water, dry out your effluent, work with some community groups or youth groups to bag it and sell it for you? One of the options we have been looking at is uh, going to a boiler to create steam heat that we could use for a number of purposes and potentially put a steam turbine on it uh, to use the excess steam. And uh, yeah, we're looking at a wide variety of options for using that heat. Cool. Uh, yeah, in the back. Yep. Yeah. Um, have you looked at any, um, as far as value-added products, have you investigated any aquaponics? Or, I mean, you, they need electricity to run the pumps, they need warm water for fish. And they, you can grow some of your own feed if you, and purify your water to some degree with the plant side of something like that. It's intriguing. And <laughs> I don't know it that well. I wish I did. Um, if I had another life to live, it wasn't just a dairyman. Um, I didn't think I'd do this as a dairyman. Um, you just talked about it being a nucleus of a hub yeah. of different things. That might be a fit. Yeah, the, fi the fish world is kind of, the fish and plants are both very exciting to see. Yeah, that's something uh, I've been recently talking to Edmonds Community College because they have a strong horticulture program. And uh, so we're looking at having kind of a joint project on our property with uh, so kind of a training nursery that the college could use. But those are kind of options that they've been thinking about as well. And we just have talked about that in any detail yet. You know, uh, we, we're consumers of a lot of forage. I've been intrigued by greenhouses and, and sprouting sprouting plants and, feed, and hydroponically growing them and, and, uh, and, and feeding cows that way where you can layer it. And then what I see when I think of that is I go instead of, if I have 20 layers, one acre, all of a sudden is 20 acres. 
and I like that kind of multiplying factor. Um, the part that tempers me on that is uh, Daryl Vanderhoek, who's one of the, I always call the father of some of this technology, um, he says, you know, my dad did that years ago. We had the choice whether to buy the neighbor's farm or build this greenhouse and grow more acres in. He said, my dad thought we needed to build that greenhouse, and we did. He said, our whole family cursed him forever that we did buy the neighbor's farm. <laughs> so whenever you spend a dollar on one thing, you're not spending on it. So it's really, you know, it's difficult to, to send this train down a direction because when you get on a track and uh, when you j jump into this world, there's a there's lots of options and it's really fun to have all these wild ideas. But you go, okay, now what track am I going to go down? And uh, I, I I think what I like most about working with our, our business partners we have is we say. Key component of sustainability is it has to be economically viable, and it, it, it isn't. Uh, he listed out like that like everybody spent a whole bunch of there's a bunch of gift money on here, and I don't remember it as being as good as that sounded. But <laughs> <laughs> it, it really does have to stand on its own two feet. And, uh, well, we had the gifts, but we also had that huge bond that has to be paid back. <laughs> yeah. How long those motors last? Um, 30,000 hours is a rebuild. It happens on Monday. And, and, and that's, a, that's, so that's, the, the block will probably, and when they do a rebuild, they're going to change out every moving piece in it, the pistons, the heads, the, uh, if it moves, it's new. So you just basically keep the block, and that will be a... $70,000. Yeah, $70,000 later, so it'll be good to go for another 30,000 hours. Are there fuel cells that can use that methane and create electricity without all the moving parts? Not that I know, but you hear some, you know, like the Snohomish County PUD is, you know, the battery technology is changing, and, he, and that's, it, it'd be neat. Because, like, one of the problems, and I can empathize with the, the power companies, is in May and June, uh, and I, I actually appreciate even the way they're setting up their pay scale. I, I understand the theory is they don't want to pay us anything in May and June uh, because electricity has zero value to them in them months because they're long. And uh, you know, it's a, but if you could store, you know, probably juice is uh, you need to use it. It doesn't store well, you know. I recently heard that uh, King County may be testing out a new type of fuel cell at one of their wastewater treatment plants where they're capturing methane from the wastewater system. Mm -hmm. So uh, I need to talk to them and find out if, it, if they're actually doing that and if they are, if it's working. All right. In the past, the main problem with fuel cells is that they need a real pure fuel source. Right. Otherwise, the, the fuel cell just wouldn't last very long. And uh, as I said, we're only about 55-60% pure methane. And uh, for for the older fuel cells to work proper, properly, you need to have 100% methane. Question in the back there. Do you have to have certification to, to operate your digester through the state? We're licensed, yeah. We're licensed. A, we're a license, but we don't have to have a certified operator. Okay. It's a, it, that is actually, a, it, that one amazes me. Because... Uh, <laughs> I've had some really smart people come over, and actually it's testimony a little bit to the equipment that a guy as dull as me can frankly run it and make it function, and they think I'm actually good at it. <laughs> but, but it is, one thing that you got to inherently remember is in the dairy industry, it's a dairyman um, used to working with nutritionists and ruminant nutrition, and frankly, if you understand ruminant nutrition, you're a long ways ahead and run in one of these things because that's it's just a mechanical room in a lot of ways and but no they don't give there, there's not even a book to you know <laughs> that every, and every one of these digesters functions a little bit different depending on the, on the makeup of the products going in so and, and don't let Andy fool you he's a lot smarter than he claims <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me, let me, let me add something to Andy's here 
uh, he's, he's not dull. Uh, he gets there in a long ride, he gets pretty dull, but... <laughs> I come in over here. <laughs> but Andy's, Andy's just like a, a, a chef, uh, an executive chef, uh, in the kitchen when he's at the digest. Uh, I told you we're, we're using a piece of equipment that wasn't built to take the, the substrates and the feed stocks that we're putting into it. Uh, Andy sits there and adds a little of this and a little of that. He puts in some more shavings, some more commoner when he, when he thinks that that's what it needs. Uh, and he's been doing this for four years and, and he has a tremendous amount of experience now and has learned a whole lot uh, in, in that four years. The, uh, uh, the testimony to that is the fact that, uh, that the percentage of methane in our, uh, uh, in our gas is, uh, has been increasing ever since we started, and of course with the percentage of not with the percentage of gas uh, uh, going up in in the in the product, uh, it makes it more valuable. Also, the, uh, uh, the our, our compost uh, uh, the, the, is getting better. I mean, it's all it's all because uh, you know it, it's not working exactly the way he wants it, so he starts putting in more of this or more of that, or uh, and starts metering in the the booze that I told you about. Uh, or we talked about a little, a little earlier, so it, it is, uh, there's a lot of adjustments and stuff you can, you, you can do to a digester if you just, uh, if you know how to do it. You can also get in a lot of trouble too, it's a great big concrete box, if we ever screw it up we're going to have to be shut down for six months of the inside and while well, we dig it up and cut a hole in the side and boy, I don't even want to talk about it. <laughs> so that's one of the reasons I get a different digester. <laughs> what, it is good though to know like when you play with the recipe and why you should and why these mixed substrate digesters I think uh, that's it's an important attribute because you can create a gas quality um, sulfur is your enemy and if you tweak the recipe you can you can make those uh, and I think uh, the fats are it's just like feeding a cow you know, uh, if you give her, you feed her correctly, you know, basically manure, if you think of manure as like the forage portion of the ration, you got it, it, it requires it just, you got to have the right amount of fiber going in at all times to keep it happy. But then you got to pour on just enough fat, just enough protein, and just enough simple sugars that you can make it really perform. I mean, dairymen get that. That's, a, and that digestive function is really the same way. And, and you're, you're, you just get to see it instead of milk production and health, you see it in gas quality and lack of sulfur. Uh, the guys on straight manure, they fight a significant number of problems that we do not fight. Our problems are different, but they fight sulfur issues and things like that. So we're going to end it there because we only have about 10 minutes before we're out of this. Okay, one more. Uh, two, Two-fold question, they tie into your giant uh, woman there. And uh, do you have any uh, data on the microflora of your digester? No, see that's a lot bigger word than I know. So <laughs> 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 I wish I could say yes, but not really. And uh, what's the breakdown from the highest to the lowest of your, um, your gas that's issued? Yes, we have, and I, do you know that? Do you know what the numbers are when they do that? Yeah. Basically, we're, I know we're running typically around 62% methane, and the, the other portion of it is CO2, right? Yeah. Well, the burnable gases, methane is by far the major con constituent. You know, there's a little bit of butane and some of the other uh, gases, but I think the others all total less than two percent. Mm -hmm. uh, but otherwise, you know, it's primarily uh, the nitrous oxides and the, uh, the carbon oxides that uh, make up the remainder of our gas. We have a very small percentage of, of uh, sulfur oxides. Uh, when we started out our project, I think we were about 
2,000 parts per million of uh, socks. And, uh, we found out by talking to some of the digester operators in the Midwest that uh, you add just a little bit of air to the digester, even though it's an anaerobic process. It actually helps the microbes that break down sulfur compounds. And uh, I think since we started doing that, we've been keeping our uh, SOX emissions down to about uh, 50 parts per million or less. And usually below 20. Yeah, that's really ate them up in 2020. Yeah, so. Adding a little bit of air was a real cheap way to deal with the SOX issue. So uh, let's conclude there. Uh, thank you so much for coming, gentlemen. And uh, thank you for a lot and Commissioner Romero's office for really uh, you know, bringing this together. Um, and we have about 10 minutes to still mingle and to kind of ask questions informally, uh, get to know one another, and enjoy the snacks that are available. Good.